of the speakers uh, to avoid uh, uh, disturbing noise and uh, put your questions in the chat that will be um, uh, managed afterwards in the Q&A session. So I would like to invite now uh, Philip and David to switch on their camera. I don't see you, but I hope you are here. Yes, yes, we have. Alisa, yes. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. I don't see uh, this is uh, the the not nice uh, of uh, Teams that is not easy to see people and the presentation at the same time. So uh, I'm Elisa Ravagnan, the coordinator of uh, Astral and uh, uh, with uh, uh, Philip James, coordinator of Acquavite and David Bassett, the general secretary of EATIP. We are pleased to welcome you in our joint event, uh, joint side event at the Aquacult uh, All Atlantic 2021. So um, just we have uh, a lot to, to say and we would like, so we are, uh, we would like to uh, welcome all of you that you uh, that decide to participate in, uh, in this side event. And we are pleased also to have with us a representative from Feral Brazil and uh, from the DG Research. Thank you. Let's go uh, a little bit ahead why we uh, decide to have this uh, joint event. Uh, so EATIP, the European Aquaculture Technology and Innovation Platform, uh, and two projects awarded uh, in, uh, in one of the Age 2020 call, uh, the Blue Growth uh, All Atlantic Ocean flagship, new, um, uh, new value chain for aquaculture, uh, Astral and Aquavita. Uh, I've decided to have this, uh, um, this uh, joint event because we share the same goal to develop, to support and to promote the sustainable aquaculture in the Atlantic area uh, establish by establishing best uh, farming practices, technology development and innovation. And of course, uh, for us, stakeholders and society engagement is one of our main priority. So thank you to be with us and to engage with us today. This is definitely in line with the new um, strategic aquaculture guidelines that uh, came out a few days ago, uh, Blue Farming, where both David and uh, Philip were invited speakers. So there is a, a close connection between those guidelines and what the researcher and the institute and the um, the platform IATIP uh, are doing innovation and technology are uh, providing uh, as uh, um, uh, as input, and this is really very nice uh, to see that there is a continuous exchange. The guidelines uh, for the uh, it's a very interesting document. I suggest you if you are interested in aquaculture, I really suggest you to to have a look at it. Uh, is a drawing is um, establishing the guidelines for the aquaculture in Europe for the next 10 years, but probably more. And is uh, um, the low trophic species and IMTA are uh, quite in focus. And of course, the golden words are sustainable aquaculture. So we are bridging the gap of what the EU society wants with uh, want to achieve and we try also to help the industry to achieve that. Going ahead, uh, another uh, of the things that uh, um, EATIP, Aquavita and Astral uh, feel uh, in, in their heart is this new, um, the proposed pledge from the, um, the research from the Atlantic, uh, uh, all Atlantic uh, community is to pledge for the for the Atlantic Ocean. It means some specific uh, goal that we uh, set for ourselves to uh, to go uh, because the Atlantic Ocean needs more than uh, flowing words. That's a really very nice slogan. I really like it. So uh, each of us has put a pledge. Uh, Astral is a focus on uh, empowering women in uh, in aquaculture. Um, um, Aquavita is uh, um, establishing a, a platform for uh, low trophic uh, species 
and uh, uh, AATIP is uh, uh, focusing on uh, on a multi-stakeholder platform. Of course, uh, we are not don't want to go uh, alone. Uh, please engage with us in this and uh, uh, in any other activity that we are uh, promoting, and uh, because together we can go farther than alone. Two words about who we are and uh, why are here. So uh, I can uh, I will start presenting Astral. Astral is of course um, responding uh, to the call and to the promoting the Belém uh, statement, also the agreement between the European Union, Brazil and South Africa, and also the other agreement between uh, uh, the European Union and Argentina. Uh, Astral, we we will have the first birthday in uh, in September, so uh, we basically just started the project, but and we are really very happy to have uh, uh, Aquavita to look at as our uh, big uh, uh, twin, uh, no, not twin, but big brother uh, project. So Astral is composed by four established IMTA labs, so case studies that we call IMTA labs uh, along the along the uh, um, Atlantic area uh, that are operating in offshore uh, flow through and uh, flow through inshore and recirculating inshore systems. And we have one prospective uh, interlab in Argentina that will uh, is just starting and will uh, learn from the experience of the others. Um, we, of course, address several species uh, and several chains in, uh, in all our IMTA labs. Uh, and we, of course, assess also the added value and the um, nova species and uh, nova species combinations. Um, we, of course, also we look at the circularity and the environmental assessment as well as the feasibility and the profitability of the chain. Uh, in addition, we also monitor uh, some uh, stressors, uh, especially for um, um, the hormone fiber bloom, the my pathogens, microplastic, and the effect of climate change connected with uh, aquaculture. Uh, we are also developing an innovative technology pool com um, composed by sensor, biosensor, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, platforms. But one of the key words is the co-create, co-create with, uh, with the stakeholders and co-create with the society at large through the our platform, uh, stakeholder platform, Aquaculture Alix, and the operative uh, part that is the aquaculture, Atlantic Aquaculture Network. And also, last but not, uh, uh, not least, is the capacity building and the transfer of knowledge. And now I let... Um, Philip, to go ahead and talk a little bit about Aquavita. Uh, great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for joining. Um, in 30 seconds, Aquavita, I know many of you are very familiar with it. Um, the overall aim is to increase uh, sustainable production of low trophic aquaculture species in five selected uh, value chains across the Atlantic. Um, we just celebrated our second birthday, so we are we're a bit older than uh, than Astral, um, but the two projects have many many synergies, and we're we're, we're working closely together. Um, you can see the value chains that we've selected there: macroalgae, IMTA, echinoderms, shellfish, and finfish. Within those five value chains, we have thir uh, eleven different case studies um, on more species or topic specific uh, topics. And then we have two cross-cutting case studies as well, um, use of byproducts uh, and allotrophic species and marine feeds. Um, I'm not going to go into more, more detail than that. You're going to hear from some of them today. Um, other than to say in the blue uh, farming meeting the other day, I think it's the first time uh, certainly in my experience with the EU where allotrophic species have been so predominantly um, uh, displayed. So that was a really a good sign, uh, I think, from the EU guidelines. Um, so on top of the specific case studies, uh, of course, we have much more cross-cutting um, aims in the project. We have a technology workshop looking at sensors. 
We cover the four sustainability pillars, environmental, social, economic, policy and governance. And we have an extensive training uh, and university course um, development uh, section as well as, as dissemination and, and exploitation. So uh, you, you have plenty of opportunities to come and visit us and find out more. We're part of the All Atlantic Ocean community, of course, focusing on the Bellum Statement as Elisa explained as well. Um, Elisa, can you change? So um, that's all I wanted to say about Aquavita at this point in time. You're going to hear more about EATIP from David Bassett at 1.20. Um, I'm going to chair the meeting. Uh, I will remind you that the meeting is recorded. So if you turn your video on, you will be recorded. And please don't forget to put any questions you have in the chat function. And if you could address them to the speaker, that would be great. So each speaker will have seven minutes. Uh, it's very short, so we'll need to keep the time. David will have a little bit longer at the end, and you can see from the agenda here that we've broken it down into different sections. So I'm going to kick straight off into it. The first is aquaculture innovation challenges and opportunities. In each section, we have a speaker from Austral and a speaker from Aquavito. So I would ask uh, Charlotte Dupont from um, uh, Austral to, to load her talk and, and give us our first presentation of the afternoon. Yes, thank you very much. I will share my presentation. Hope you can see it now. Yes, very good. OK, great. So thank you uh, for this introduction. So I am Charlotte Dupont. I am co-founder of a French company called Biocyanor, and I'm a member of Astral Consortium. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about predicting uh, water quality events, uh, which is our specialty at Biocyanor and also one of the tasks uh, of Astral. So uh, why predicting uh, water quality events is uh, really important uh, because, of course, water quality is the key to any type of aquaculture. Uh, water is the medium and it has to be well controlled. Um, it, it has to be controlled inside the production, but also upstream of the production and downstream of the, the production uh, to really ensure sustainability. We want to control uh, what is coming out uh, of the production also to, to be sure to reduce the pressure on the ecosystems. Um, and sometimes the farmers, there is some specific harmful events. I'm thinking about, for example, uh, algae bloom. Uh, that seems to be unpredictable and they are really helpless uh, when they are facing them. So now, oops, sorry, I think I have. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so now with the um, uh, machine learning tools and uh, big data tools, uh, it is now possible to predict many water quality events and I will talk about it uh, just now. So one of the main uh, challenges uh, to predict water quality is to uh, improve sustainability. So, uh, for example, the oxygen variation is really the reflection of fish welfare. If they have if there are too many in a fish farm, they will, the oxygen will decrease. Uh, but also if they are not fed at the right time, they will agitate more and then the oxygen will decrease. Um, so it is really the reflection of also the production yields and all the ecosystem health around. So monitoring the oxygen very closely is really essential uh, to better manage the, the production and the key to success uh, to sustainability. Uh, with predicting oxygen level, it also uh, allows uh, to anticipate and make better decision about the fish production uh, and then to make a better decision related to uh, the fish welfare. Uh, also predicting to improve maintenance. So to have accurate and reliable data is really essential to be able to propose good analysis, forecast and services. If you cannot rely on the data, we cannot rely also on the prediction and the analysis that we have based on this data. So uh, we know that, for example, sensors uh, drift when they are emerged in the water for a very long time. And so predicting the sensor drift is very interesting and very important uh, so we can always be sure that we have the right data correct data and at any time and when there is an, an alert uh, then can be recalibrated uh, very quickly and not to wait for another month uh, to have good data 
And we can also predict, like I said, the unpredictable. Uh, for example, I'm from Ag Agal Bloom. It's uh, very dangerous for uh, a production. It can, it can cause massive loss in a production. Um, and generally, uh, farmers are really uh, uh, helpless when they are facing them, and it, and it seems really unpredictable. But in fact, uh, with water quality sensors, satellite imaging, uh, weather information, and of course, some machine learning tools, uh, it is possible to anticipate uh, the condition that favors algal bloom and to trigger an alert. So change can be made uh, to anticipate uh, to anticipate uh, the, this problem. And uh, one of Astral tasks is exactly to do that. Uh, we are working on trying to uh, alert uh, when there is an algal bloom based on satellite imaging, based on water quality sensors and some weather information. Uh, so it, it is really one of the, the tasks of Astral. So to finish, just a quick um, overview of what we are doing at Biosanor. So we are really focusing on the prediction uh, analysis. We use uh, sensors that are emerged continuously into the water uh, to gather a lot of data. It is really crucial to have a lot of data and not only one data per day, per hour. It is better to have continuous data. And with this continuous data, we used um, uh, outside data like weather, satellite imaging, and we can make every 20 minutes, we can make a prediction about the, uh, the water quality parameters, uh, how they are going to uh, change in the next hours. Um, and it can be up to 48 hours in advance. So uh, this is an example of uh, oxygen prediction. So in blue is the real um, uh, data of oxygen and the three other colored line are the, um, the prediction of the oxygen in the, ne in the, the future hours. Uh, and we are trying to predict the evolution to see if there is going to be a major drop, drop or rise of, uh, of the, the, what, the oxygen. Also on the right, you can see the anomaly detection. So you can see an alert uh, when there is a decalibration with the predictive maintenance. And it is very uh, important so we can have very accurate data. So just a few um, uh, key points of uh, Bersano. We are based in the south of France, in Sofia Antipolis. We have three years of existence. Uh, we have one office in Bergen, in Norway, and one in San Francisco. Uh, we are now 19 collaborators and with a lot of different specialty, marine biologists, aquaculture, data science, um, and we are involved in several uh, innovative projects. And we are very proud that our solution has been labeled by Solar Impulse Foundation as a, one of the thousand efficient solutions um, and engaged into three uh, UN SDG. So thank you very much. And in conclusion, I will say that uh, predicting the water quality events is really uh, the key to succeed a sustainable business. And uh, I really encourage everyone to cooperate through this uh, all Atlantic aquaculture business, and it will considerably, considerably increase the potential of anticipation and action. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Very interesting and, and extremely applicable, of course, when we're talking about marine systems. So thank you very much. Don't forget, if you have questions for the speakers, you can add them in uh, the chat function. And we will have a, a question and answer session at the end of this, um, just before we close the webinar. So I would ask, thanks again, Charlotte. Very, very good. Um, Erd, I would ask that we, we uh, if you can load your presentation and carry on. Uh, so yeah, introducing, sorry, Erd, Erd Buck um, from Aquavitae and the Faroe Islands. Erd. Hi everyone, my, yeah, as Philip said, my name is Erd Buck. I'm the research member of Ocean Rainforest. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I would like to use the next seven minutes to tell you more about the innovation challenges and opportunities uh, that we see for the offshore uh, seaweed cultivation in the Atlantic Ocean and also the work we are doing in Aquavita in relation to this. Um, and now I'd like the slide to change, come. Yeah. So first, uh, some words about ocean rainforest. Uh, we are located in the North Atlantic Ocean, where we grow sugar kelp um, on, on lines. 
sugar kelp is a large brown seaweed with, and today we have a, a annual production of 250 tons sweet wheat. Uh, this is a picture from our deep water location where there's high waves in the Fair Islands. And the slides goes a bit slow here. Turn again. Um, try using your cursor on the actual, yeah. Yeah. So now you see the next one, I hope. Um, we have developed a rig, a cultivation rig that is survivable in these exposed and deep water locations. And the macroalgae cultivation rig has now been in operation for nearly 10 years. And we have 100,000 uh, meters of, of grow line in the, in the sea. They are directly seeded uh, with the seeding material from our own hatchery and local seed material. We use a, a harvest method called multiple parcel harvesting, so we can leave a part of the blade of the seaweed and re uh, and harvest six times from the same line before we, we seed a new line. Um, this is uh, the ocean, ocean rainforest team. In uh, Aquavita, Ocean Rainforest is uh, leading case study two, which is sustainable offshore macroalgae cultivation. And the objectives are to test kelp in abalone feed, to find suitable sites for large scale uh, cultivation in the Atlantic Ocean, to reduce cost of production and to upscale uh, the cultivation in the Fair Islands. Um, so to test the, the, the kelp in the Abalone feed. We have a transatlantic collaboration with Rhodes University and Mary Feed, and uh, they are testing the dried sugar kelp in their abalone feed pellets in a biosecure way. Uh, to find suitable sites for this uh, large scale farming, uh, Fiskaling, a research institute in the Fair Islands, has uh, made um, a, a GIS mapping, a, mo a model about. Um, sites that we can use for this cultivation, where they have included water depth, current, waves, and environmental and spatial marine uh, the use of the marine areas. And um, I will not go into details with this, but there's a full report on that. Uh, and in the same way, uh, Drew Risnick has used the same criteria for, um, for mapping suitable sites in the Gulf of Maine. She, is a master, she was a master student from the University of Edinburgh. Um, so this graph shows how we aim to upscale our production in the Faroe Islands using five different sites. And um, by 2025, having 3,000 tons of production annually, uh, taking up a marine area of 100 hectares. Uh, we have made an investigation of how we can reuse uh, agriculture equipment and found that anchors, chains and buoys are suitable for reuse, whereas ropes are less um, uh, appropriate as they need to be clean and have a certain strength uh, to work. So. We have tested this in, in um, our cultivation rigs deployed at sea and if in an optimal scenario where we have um, anchors, buoys and chains as second hand equipment, we, we can save 40% of the cost. We have also tested mechanical harvesting uh, because today we do manual harvesting as you see on the left picture where we use a knife. When we, when we use a mechanical harvesting machine, which is not finally developed, but in, in a really good stage right now, now um, we can increase yield per day by five and reduce the cost by 84 percentages. So this is my last, last, last slide. Um, the yield per meter is crucial to make seaweed cultivation in the Atlantic Ocean profitable and to comply with products that are already established. So selective breeding is really important to increase the yield and lower cost together with the mechanization of seeding and harvesting and landing. And it is an opportunity to reuse the aquaculture equipment, even though the more we, we grow, the less uh, 
if if not the agriculture sector grow in the same speed, then we will maybe lack some some secondhand equipment. Um, and we found that there is a potential to grow in kelp across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but we need to adapt to the local conditions and there's not uh, one solution that fits all. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you may have or you can get in touch with us um, by mail or by through these channels. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Urd. Um, that's a topic very close to my heart, as you know, in the north of Norway, so very, very interesting. Um, in the interest of time, I, I think we'll move on, but if you have a question for Urd, then please do put it in the chat. We'll either come back to it in the chat session or we will get Urd to contact you directly um, and, and answer your question. So thank you. Thank you again, Urd. Um, and that concludes the Aquaculture Innovation to, uh, talk. So we now move to Policy and Sustainability Framework, Challenges and Opportunities. And the first speaker is Cristina Lopez um, from Astral in Spain. And Cristina, I ask you to, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, I hope you can see the screen. Is it okay? Yes, yes we can. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm part of the Astral team working with the project and I'm Cristina Jacob, a social scientist from LEITAT. And uh, what we do in Astral is, uh, apart from other things, it's uh, working the pol uh, into the policy and social dimensions and see how it can be um, also achieved in order to afterwards uh, use it uh, in the capacity building and sharing knowledge processes. So this is one of the tasks, as, um, as Elisa said at the beginning, is uh, one task um, that is not yet implemented. So I'm only going to talk about the concept of, uh, conceptual part of it. And it's closely related, as I was saying, to the co-creation part of the networking and as well to, to the implementation with stakeholders uh, for knowledge sharing. So if you can see the second slide, see, can you see them all? Because I yeah, think yes, I, we can. Yes, yeah, perfect. It's strange yeah. how I'm seeing it. So, OK. So uh, the idea, the concept is to mix uh, the policies that are related to aquaculture, but also taking into account the social acceptability of aquaculture, and in our case on IMTA uh, technologies, and taking into account the, appro the approach or social license to operate. And also we would like to take into account the food safety issues and the consumer trust because we consider these two aspects are also key for the intake of the technology. And how we are going to do that, uh, sorry. it's uh, related to two lines of action. For one hand, we will uh, realize some policy briefs and recommendations, and for the other side, we will develop some social assessments that will nourish afterwards these recommendations. And how we are going to do that with qualitative and quantitative methodologies as participatory workshops and structured interviews, desktop studies and virtual surveys. And uh, this, this policy that I mentioned, the part of policies, we want to do it in a, in a multiple dimension, beginning with the European framework. It's good that we have now these new guidelines that uh, the, European, the European Commission uh, uh, had and we also want to know in the national level what happens in the different countries in Europe we are working but as well in Brazil, in South Africa and Argentina apart from other countries from the alliance and we also we don't want to start from zero but we want to work with our uh, twin projects or with our big brothers as Aquavita and, and so on to get from their insights, uh, begin to grow. And the idea is to do these policy and recommendations based on that, compare the different legislations in the assessment we've done, 
and identify the barriers, constraints, challenges we need to, to achieve. As I was saying before, the idea is this could be nourished by the social analysis we are going to develop, that it has three main points. On first, we want to identify the social challenges at the local scales with the different sectors that are involved in the aquaculture, in precisely with IMTA. Then assess the consumer perceptions, how they see it and in the different countries, and especially highlighting the food safety concerns and the human health requirements. And finally, we also want to evaluate the role of certification in, consum in consumer choice. In Astra, we are evaluating the eco value change and the organic standard, the organic standards on it, and we want to see how it could be approached through the consumer perspective, and also the VIP certification process. And well, as I said before, all of that will will help us with the recommendations. And mainly, uh, two days ago we were in a in another event of Al Atlantic uh, regarding of data, and there they were talking about. As we as a scientist sometimes forget about the users and the, somebody said who are the users and well the users or the stakeholders or the actors we can name it very differently I like a lot somebody else replay that the, that the ocean is for all of us so it's really important to take into account these integrations that's why initiatives like this one are really really important and from our point of view, it's interesting to, to remember that social science and, and humanities it are really interesting and important to be included into the projects, not only as a capacity building activities or as um, transfer of knowledge, but uh, uh, trying to introduce them since the beginning of the project with a common goal and thinking about which, problem, which problems we want to address commonly and especially to, to present sustainable and fair solutions for them. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I hope if you have any questions and anything else, we can talk about this afterwards. Thank you very much, Christina. Very interesting. And um, I think, the, as I mentioned, the, poly, the, the pillars of uh, sustainability, uh, social uh, governance and policy and economics are absolutely crucial. So very interesting. Thank you. Um, don't forget to put your questions for Christina in the chat box. And I would ask um, Wagner, uh, who is from University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, um, to present his presentation. Wagner. Uh, good morning and good afternoon for all. I will share my screen. Maybe it's shared now. Can yes, you see? Per perfect, Wagner. You're all set to go. Yep. Okay. Let's go. Um, we are talking about the aquavitae perspective of sustainability framework uh, and policy. And uh, as people that uh, speak before told, uh, uh, the target of the both project Astral and Aquavitae uh, is to provide and to um, encourage the adoption of sustainable uh, aquaculture system. Thus, uh, if you want to go to to uh, improve the policies and uh, if you want to create good policies, you need to create a good sustainability system and good sustainability concepts. And uh, sorry, please. And thus uh, now, uh, we are put together the work package six that is, is on sustainability and the work package eight that is on policy and uh, 
Uh, I will start by the background and uh, you use it as background the, the human natural nexus that is uh, extremely necessary and uh, we can represent in this diagram. In the center is the production process and aquaculture is a production process and it's similar to that one. And uh, the interaction with the production social with the environmental uh, uh, all uh, aquaculture receive energy and raw materials from the environment and and uh, deliver waste, uh, put waste in the environment and uh, the interaction with the society is because aquaculture produce goods and services to the society that is the products of the aquaculture and receiving puts also uh, by the socioeconomic research and uh, the major is the knowledge and the workforce. And uh, based in this traditional and very natural concept of uh, human natural society nexus and um, we look for the major documents to direct our actions and uh, the major documents that we uh, we have here is the united Nations documents the agenda 21 and uh, the agenda 2000, uh, 2030. Agenda 2030 reinforced all the concepts of agenda 2021. Uh, and uh, based on these documents, we adopt the model of uh, three dimensions of sustainability and uh, we use the elliptical model and not the three circles with uh, intersection uh, because the concept is different. We have an environmental dimension, the society dimension, the economy dimension, and uh, we represent like this because the environment is much more important because the environment is totally independent. Society is dependent to the environment and the economy is dependent to the society and to the environment. And in addition, we add uh, a four dimension that is governance that uh, is uh, necessary to obtain the other the other dimensions and uh, after that we need to look for uh, a real concept of sustainable aquaculture and they use this one that is the profitable production of aquatic organisms with perennial and harmonic interaction with the environment and local human population that is a very well accepted concept and uh, after that we start to work and thus we first define the desired states of sustainable aquaculture and uh, we associate the desired states uh, with the SDGs of uh, Agenda 2030 and uh, we selected the suitable indicators to measure low trophic aquaculture sustainability um, and thus we associate the sustainability indicators with the desired states and the SDGs and uh, based on this work we establish um, a framework um, for assess sustainability and uh, to create uh, real sustainable systems uh, in which we have four dimensions economic environmental social and governance and this dimension is associated with the sdgs and for each dimension we have different indicators that measure different features of uh, the aquaculture system. And this framework was very important to support policymakers and uh, to provide good concepts and pr to provide new systems uh, using new species and low trophic species and uh, for policymakers to um, to prepare a secure policy to promote sustainable development based on aquaculture of low trophic species. Oh, I forget to say that in addition to this, what did the methods to assess, assess ecosystem services provided by low trophic uh, species aquaculture? That is uh, very large. We have about 70 ecosystem services. And uh, um, thus uh, the major actions of the, the policy development that uh, uh, have been worked in the Aquavitae is the interaction for Atlantic North to Atlantic South, uh, mainly European countries and uh, Brazil and South Africa. And uh, the first step was to mapping the policies in the European Union, Brazil and South Africa, analyze the current policies framework for aquaculture, analyze the current industry perception and identify policies needs and uh, gaps. 
and uh, then and uh, using the background of sustainable systems uh, using low traffic species there is policy recommendation and actions and the measure is the support dialogue process that is uh, still in course promote and improve uh, new dialogue process, provide recommendations for low trophic species aquaculture framework, assist in, lic uh, in license and permissions, that is a uh, 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 sensible uh, point, and uh, some others. Uh, and thus I think that uh, it is very important to interact the sustainability with policy to really provide uh, policies based on sustainable aquaculture. Thanks for our attention. My contact is here and uh, I work at Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. Thank you very much, Wagner. Very interesting and I've put in a plug for a Aquavitae deliverable there if you want. This is all presented in great detail in a recent deliverable from Aquavitae that will become open access shortly. Uh, and I believe will be published as an organisational report. So thank, thanks, Wagner. Any questions to Wagner, please add them to the chat. Um, very good. Uh, so that uh, that ends the policy and sustainability framework section. We now move to capacity building, challenges and opportunities. And the first speaker there is Michaela Aschen from the uh, University of Tromsø here in Norway uh, from the Aquavitae project. Uh, Michaela. Um, the floor is yours. So just, uh, yeah, there we go. Perfect. You're ready to go. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to be together with you today. Uh, I will talk about uh, uh, the capacity building and uh, it means mainly student exchange and online training. But uh, as capacity building is a duty of all societal challenge projects and also global challenge projects, upcoming ones, uh, both Astral and Aquavita has taken this um, kind of a duty very uh, uh, kind of seriously and there are several actions and activities so we will not be able to present all of it today but we give you some examples yes so uh, the projects give us an opportunity to really make students uh, meet and and travel and meet each other and this kind of give us the opportunity to kind of realize these uh, ambitious and multicultural projects and build this builds bridges not just between countries and across the Atlantic but also between disciplines and industry. And uh, in Aquavita we have had the main focus on industry apprenticeships and on student exchange. And we already have had PhD students traveling across the Atlantic. And I just give you one example. Um, we have Stephanie who uh, is uh, has gone from uh, is going from Brazil uh, from the University of uh, uh, São Paulo uh, to Portugal to work at uh, Porto University. And in addition to kind of bridge between these academic institutions and the research. The, her main kind of aims is to increase knowledge on the biochemical characteristics of macroalgae to kind of ensure that algae are edible and, and eaten in proper amounts and also exchange methods to assess farm ecosystem services. Now, as the heading says, or so the title says, we face some challenges and I would like to highlight the main challenge, challenge that we have had during the last year uh, and that is of course due to the COVID-19 and we know that students and especially PhD students who often have a kind of demanding workload during their, uh, during their project uh, are the ones who are having severe challenges. And we know from studies done already late 2019, uh, for instance, in Canada, 40% of the PhD candidates report poor mental health. And in EU, 32% uh, of the PhD candidates asked reported de depression. So we 
definitely have some challenges here, especially when we know that international students who then feel extremely isolated uh, are the ones who are the most challenged and have the biggest uh, challenges. I have examples of candidates arriving in uh, Norway early January, February, and they hardly managed to make any friends before everything was closed down. And I'm sure this is the case throughout all the way around the Atlantic. Um, so uh, thereby this mobility ambition and this internationalization has been hampered. That is a fact. But what solutions can we see here? And I, we have been discussing this with the, with the Commission and seeing if it would be possible to allow um, mobility, not just geographically, but just now in this period when we cannot travel, to allow uh, students to move from academia to industry or to the public sector to work within the current within the field of aquaculture. Other solutions are of course there and we have utilized them at the most and they are all these online opportunities. And one of the activities that we started last year is the Aquavita Low Trophic Life webinars where young scientists get the opportunity to present their work every Thursday each month at 2 o'clock CST. So if you wish to join, you are welcome. It's an open forum and anybody can join and listen and even contribute if they wish to. And here is the link uh, in the presentation. We distribute it afterwards. In addition, we already had a plan to make a course. This course um, is going to be a massive open online course in sustainable aquaculture for low trophic species. Uh, the course is going to be uh, available on an open edX platform and our aim is to create both um, the material for online students. They would be a master level, so you should have a bachelor background from a slightly relevant field, but you can also join if you have an industry background. But also this material is going to be available for teachers to use so that you may even use the course uh, in a flipped classroom context. Uh, the point is that we are where this is all open, so you can use bits and pieces or the whole co course if you wish to do so. Uh, the course is divided into 10 modules and we have started working on these and we have gotten also interest from FAO uh, to contribute on the, tem on the module on future of uh, low trophic aquaculture. We will also include aspects of uh, how to prepare for climate change and other relevant issues. The whole course is considered to be a workload of approximately five uh, ECTs. So approximately 12 hours by for each module. So if you have any input, wish to contribute or have a book that just appeared that might fit in here, please contact us. Adriana, my colleague will be very happy to receive any input. So finally, to some conclusions and advice. The main thing, take care of your students and ensure that they are happy and well and uh, ensure that they get the necessary help if in case they are struggling. Provide online meetings or meeting points. For instance, cafe, online cafes or writing rooms, we call them shut up and write. Our uh, PhDs tell us that this is a very good environment to be focused and even get some support. Uh, and use our webinars or visit to our webinars. And use our MOOC uh, or uh, include the material that we are going to provide in your own courses. Uh, for instance, this is going to be an optional course available for international fisheries management students here at the Arctic University of Norway. And finally, allow mobi mobility from academia to industry, uh, perhaps in the same region or in the same country even, until we are allowed to travel again and meet physically. 
so thank you for your attention. Very good. Thank you very much, Michaela. Touching on some really important points there, obviously, with uh, educating the young people towards sustainable aquaculture mm -hmm. and looking after them in the process. Yep, thank you very much. Don't forget questions in the chat if you have any, and we will come back to them in the chat um, section later in the webinar. So, uh, on to the last talk before we have a short comfort break. It's Marissa Brinkhull. Uh, she's from Astral um, Project at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Marissa. Hi, um, yeah, as mentioned, uh, I'll be speaking on uh, my experience as an All Atlantic Youth Ambassador um, and as part of the Astral IMTA Lab in South Africa from a capacity development perspective. So just for some context, I'll be starting by introducing some findings from a recent report compiled on the critical skills needed in the South African aquaculture industry by Operation Pekisa. This is an initiative of the South African government to implement solutions to the critical development issues in the aquaculture sector. Some challenges that were identified include uh, aquaculture farm management, training, hatchery skills, education and food safety, all of which could contribute to improved sustainability, which is also a goal of Astral. And these are some of the issues identified locally, but we have the opportunity to learn from each other to address these shortcomings in our respective regions uh, through collaborative efforts. And though we are still aiming to get involved in the aquaculture space, the uh, Encore Youth Ambassadorship is an example of this. I have been given the opportunity to work with a group of 25 young ocean enthusiasts. Our goals include building a network for knowledge sharing and spreading ocean awareness to impact the protection of our ocean. We are slowly but surely getting more involved in the Encore joint actions and we are taking part in local and global community engagement campaigns. We also hosted a side event at this conference yesterday to shed light on the challenges faced by young ocean professionals and we are contributing to various online events to promote our message, such as the Early Career Ocean Professionals Day as part of the launch of the UN Ocean Decade, which was very successful. This program is also equipping us with the skills uh, to promote ocean awareness through various workshops and seminars, with most of what we do being on virtual platforms as we form part of this research alliance across the Atlantic. Though we span across 14 countries, we all have the common goal of wanting to implement change to protect our oceans. And as part of Astral, I work on the development and implementation of new aquaculture technology to contribute to this. Briefly, integrated multitrophic aquaculture, which many of you will be familiar with, is where aquaculture species from different trophic levels are co-cultured in a way where one species' byproducts can be used uh, by another. Here, for example, the particulates from the sea urchin system becomes a food resource for the sea cucumbers and the dissolved nutrients are cycled into the seaweed tank where it is used as fertilizer and contributes to feed production as well as water quality management. This is one part of our IMTA lab as part of the South African partner in the stroll where I'm affiliated with the University of Cape Town and the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. Our overall objective is to develop and validate cost-effective IMTA in land-based pump ashore systems. In this system, abalone are grown on land in raceway tanks. A green seaweed, ulva, is grown in the abalone effluent in large paddle raceways, which is what you can see in the center of the image here. And the ulva is then used as an additional feed and 50% of the water from the ulva system is recirculated back to the abalone tanks. We also aim to assess the physical and chemical parameters of the abalone ulva IMTA system, uh, including the microbial community to provide uh, information on biosecurity, species health and system health. We will also develop culture technology for the production of a new high value sea urchin species Trypneus gratilla in an IMTA system. The potential for the production of additional value added products uh, from the IMTA will also be investigated, uh, particularly the use of effluent grown ulva as a supplementary feed or feed additive to enhance growth, health, product quality and sustainability of cultured abalone and sea urchin. 
And we will also assess the use of fecal matter from the sea urchin Paracinus angulosus as a feed or probiotic for juvenile abalone, where this objective and the microbiome work forms the bulk of my postdoctoral research. As a start, we can already see some benefits to the ulva abalone system uh, in terms of the microbiome based on 16S next generation sequencing. Notably, we observed a reduction of various members of the sometimes pathogenic Vibrio genus depicted in dark blue in systems with ulva when compared to samples taken from inlets or outlets of the abalone raceways, regardless of the season in which uh, the samples were collected. Though these results are preliminary, the use of molecular techniques will provide insight to the complex microbial communities within IMTA systems and their contribution to the health of the animals cultivated therein. We hope to share more of these results and the methods used to get to them um, in the future, as Astral also has formal and informal capacity building activities, where I form part of the formal one as a postdoc affiliated with the project. So keep an eye out for the workshops we'll be running, as some of these will likely be online. These will be focused on various aspects of aquaculture that could include uh, seaweed, land-based and inshore aquaculture, larval rearing practices and algal growth, methods used for microbiome studies and modeling growth in aquaculture. These workshops can contribute to knowledge sharing and skill transfer, and therefore through collaborative efforts such as Astral, Encore and the Ambassadorship, uh, we can address some of the challenges faced in this industry. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Marissa. Very interesting and what a fantastic initiative to encourage uh, young people into the areas that are required to build the industry. Fantastic. And IMCA is a really up and coming area of interest in the EU, so extremely topical. Thank you very much. Um, I see we are having some difficulties in the chat function. Not everybody can get into it. Um, we'll see if we can have a look at that over the break. Um, but now we've concluded the challenges and opportunities in terms of capacity building. We're going to have a five minute comfort break. So I would ask that you come back at 2.35, that's in seven minutes time, and we'll uh, begin again with the industry role in research challenges and opportunities. So we'll see you in seven minutes time. OK, welcome back, everybody. Um, so moving right along, we're now going to um, hear from the industry and their role in research challenges and opportunities, which of course is crucial. We need to translate these sustainability um, initiatives into actual industry opportunities. So I'm very pleased to invite Luis Porsche from Astral at the Federal University of Rio Grande, Brazil, to give the first presentation. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you to Elisa too. Uh, I, in some months ago, Elisa asked me why the Brazilian partners or the Brazilian producers uh, don't like to work uh, together. Uh, probably uh, the answer uh, we will see here. And in 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 Europe. It's, it's common, the society and the industry drive the actions, the, the government actions. And uh, uh, probably because they have a high education level, uh, a lot of research institutions uh, use uh, more uh, research dedicated to applied uh, and not only basic information uh, and because the society, the concerned society especially uh, respect to uh, environment uh, uh, problems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in, in, in Latin America and probably in Africa is the same situation. Uh, we have the research uh, dominated by uh, actions from the government and the society and industry, uh, exception the feed industry, uh, in general didn't participate 
or don't participate in the in the process. Uh, uh, we have a, a big difference from the Europe. For example, our uh, education level is low compared to Europe. For example, we have uh, in general in Latin America less research research institutions. Um, so we probably use more money uh, or support to obtain basic information and not apply only apply information. And our society is not concerned uh, respected to aquaculture and environment impacts. Uh, in, in, in our case, the people look for price, uh, low price to consume products. It's different from Europe. So uh, we have uh, these actions like Aquavita project and Astra project or other initiatives uh, that focus in uh, sustainable aquaculture. It's important to reduce our difference. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, despite the problems uh, compare one country or, or compare the countries from Europe and in, in Latin America and Africa, uh, we have a lot of opportunities to, uh, to develop things, uh, good things for us. Uh, for example, new feed technology, how the industry of uh, uh, the feed uh, producers uh, looking for alternatives to fish meal and, and, fi and fish oil uh, products. So uh, we have opportunities to find uh, alternatives to these ingredients. Um, and Brazil is uh, one of the most uh, or the top three producers uh, in, in, in food. Uh, especially uh, meat, uh, coal, uh, chicken, uh, pork, and uh, one of the uh, one partner that work with us is especially interested in substitute some uh, uh, ingredients like uh, fish meal by uh, fish. Uh, I'm sorry, so. Oh, or uh, sub products from the uh, chicken and, and coal and pork productions. Um, we need to identify, we have the opportunity to identify a better management practice like uh, uh, we have here with bioflock systems, with uh, um, and, and the shrimp production in bioflock systems or the abalone with uh, uh, uva or old uh, seaweed uh, or chains, uh, sea cucumbers, uh, uh, European lob uh, lobsters and fish and algae. We have, uh, uh, we have to identify new uh, management to reduce the problems or the environment problems. Uh, and we have to uh, identify uh, new species to work in the systems. It's not easy, especially when we need to uh, identify the relation between biomass, uh, uh, between the groups that we uh, include in the system. Uh, the role of my, my, uh, microorganisms in the systems uh, for example, the bioflock. And the bioflock is uh, a live uh, microorganism that use the nutrients, especially uh, uh, nitrogen, to grow. And this uh, bioflock is responsible to reduce the uh, nutrients in the water, improve the feed uh, or reduce the feed conversion rate and keep the system working in good conditions and in health uh, for several cycles. Uh, 
um, we can uh, start uh, uh, to use the models, mathematical models or biological models to reduce the environment impacts. This is a big deal for us. Um, the development of uh, sensors or equipment, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence for uh, for us is not common when you when you use the uh, uh, the integration or real time information. It's not common in 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 South America, uh, but this is this is very very important because when we know the information we can uh, act uh, basically at the same time when we observe the problem uh, we have uh, to develop programs to help the producer uh, to make decisions and this is 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 very important uh, the use of uh, bioproducts uh, or identify bioproducts from the, the our production systems. And of course, uh, we need to show to to producer, uh, to uh, the economic analysis and show the viability to integrate the different species uh, in, in, in the systems. So we have uh, a lot of opportunities, especially in, in Latin America and uh, in Africa, to develop uh, things to, to, to improve our system production. So I think it's, uh, that's it. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please uh, use the chat to to make uh, to make the questions. Thanks so thanks so much. Thank you very much, Louise. And I'm sure this is a point that David will mention in his presentation shortly. That there are very uh, big differences between countries and the way industries are set up and function. So. Very interesting and very important. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to the final uh, talk from Astral and Aquavite, and that's Sylvain Houchette uh, from Aquavite from France, Heliotis in France. Uh, Sylvain, I'll pass the floor over to you. Hi, uh, well, hello, and thank you for inviting me today. Do you do you see my slides and everything's OK? Yes, yes, it's you, all fine. You yeah. hear me? Absolutely. Okay, yes, that's cool. Can. Thank you. Um, so about the industry role uh, in in Aquavite, uh, well, I must say it's it's, it's a privilege for um, a, a small SME like from Saliotis. Was I mean, from Saliotis is a small abalone farm in Europe. Um, one of well, there's very few abalone farm in Europe, but but it's it's one of them. And we're very much involved in developing sustainable aquaculture. And um, to be able to be in, well, to be involved in aquavitae and in, in the research that is conducted in aquavitae, it's, it's a key for our development. And it's uh, very important for us to uh, try to imagine the aquaculture models that will be um, working tomorrow. So um, to be part of Aquavite is, 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 is uh, providing a more realistic um, well, uh, research with real economical constraints. And um, we, can, we can actually carry out research on low traffic species uh, on a larger scale. Um, Aquavite has 13 case study on low traffic species, and um, this will allow quite a faster development process in the um, development of a more sustainable aquaculture. The um, well, the the, the uh, well enhancing this industry partnership across the Atlantic will allow to create new relationship between the different partners and um, 
will allow to identify um, the, the research requirement that will get us to progress faster. OK, I will take the example of uh, the case study four in, in Aquavita. It's a, the development of um, mm. sea-based IMTA um, in aqua, well, in, in, well uh, for Aquavite partners. So the, the partners have identified the low trophic species that would be suitable uh, for core culture. And um, well, we have identified five species of seaweed for farming. We work on five different species of shellfish as well. Um, and we try to test and develop different IMTA models uh, that may work out uh, like uh, seaweed and abalone together, seaweed and mussel, uh, lobster and oyster, and uh, also a model with salmon, mussel and seaweed. So we test all this and for the sake of this presentation, I will just uh, present the example that Franz Aliotis is working on. Um, and for us, we're just exploring uh, the seaweed farming potential uh, as fresh feed for abalone. Um, so Franz Aliotis is farming abalone in benthic cage that, are, uh, well, that you can see on this slide. Uh, the abalone are just kept inside the cage and the, the cage are just left on the bottom of the sea. And as you see, because the, the production cycle is very long, then the um, seaweed has a lot of time to develop on the cage. And it's, it's a source of food for, for our abalone as well. During Aquavitae project, we, we actually work on different seaweed farming potential and we look at Alaya Esculente. It's a good seaweed to farm because it's quite productive, uh, but they are, it, it's maybe not the best for um, abalone uh, to feed on. We work on Saccharina latissima, so we've developed uh, long lines again with um, uh, Saccharina that we've we've seeded in the hatchery. So this is this is these are pictures from last week. Um, and we also work on two other species that have very good uh, nutritional value for for abalone, but are more difficult to develop. Um, at sea because they don't produce large biomass. So this is Palmaria, Palmata and Ulva. And for the sake of this um, experiment, we, we, we have done a nutrition trial with eight different species. Uh, some of them were produced in IMTA, others uh, were just collected in the wild. And uh, here are some of the results. We can see that the, the food conversion ratio for each seaweed is different. And this is an important parameter because we will use more or less of this seaweed to feed our cage. So it's, it's important. You can see that Alaya is, is, is not a, a very efficient uh, for food conversion. And, um, but others like Palmaria palmata is really, really efficient. But the best that we've, well, the best result that we've obtained in this trial was um, ulva, but not from IMTA, but ulva from um, tank culture. So in conclusion uh, for this presentation, um, we've, we, we, uh, with Aquavita, we actually demonstrate that valorizing fresh seaweed with abalone is quite a promising tool. It's, it's, it's actually pretty good because the, 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 the seaweed farming is actually recycling the nutrients from the abalone. Um, however, valorizing the seaweed in abalone is, is taking a long time. It's a pretty long production cycle, presents many risks. And experimenting this in, in the frame of Aquavite with the EU financial support and the support of the scientists uh, from the project is, is quite essential for us. And um, there's also um, a very important transatlantic partnership that is being created in this project. And um, that, that, that allows um, a faster advance in, in the research and development. And there's quite a lot of uh, benefits to exchange with others um, to gain from their experience. So, well, thank you for listening to me. 
and uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank, thank you very much, Sylvain. Very interesting to hear um, from the industry perspective. Of course, you know we we know what we need to do, but it often falls on the shoulders of small producers like yourself. Um, and so it's it's great to get that that perspective. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so we'll, we move on. As you know, um, uh, this uh, webinar is not just Astral and Aquavitae, it's also hosted by EARTIP and David is going to speak to us about an initiative um, that all three projects are involved in. So David, I pass the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Philip. I'm just going in to uh, share my uh, screen and as happened yesterday when I was checking this with your colleagues, I appear to have some problems in bringing it up. So could I call for the backup slides to come up, please, uh, just so I don't waste any time. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Vala, we'll get Vala to uh, the slide. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. We had some problems yesterday. Um, I'll begin just to, to stop um, to prevent wasting any time. Um, it's very good to be able uh, to join in this event uh, with uh, these two projects um, uh, and to be able to have uh, an aquaculture themed side event uh, within the Greater All Atlantic uh, Conference that's been going on. We've heard about uh, two projects that are currently existent um, and are currently taking place, um, but this is to introduce to you an upcoming action uh, that's considering multi-stakeholder platform development uh, within an Atlantic context uh, with the aim of supporting uh, the Bellum Statement uh, and the uh, supporting accords uh, with um, additional uh, partners to the Bellum Statement. Uh, the uh, joint action that we're working on um, is, thank you very much, Valor. I very much appreciate that. Um, if we could go straight to the first slide, please. Uh, the um, uh, support action uh, is being funded through ANCOR. That's the All Atlantic uh, Cooperation for Ocean Research and Innovation Coordination and Support Action. Uh, quite, quite a mouthful. It's being um, supported through uh, Work Package 4. The formal title of our work is the Initiation Toward a Brazilian Aquaculture Technology and Innovation Platform as a first step toward an all-Atlantic aquaculture platform. So between that and Anchor, I think I've used up half of our time just introducing it. Um, the funding, um, as I say, it's seed funding, so it's modest funding. Uh, it's being co-supported by Innovation Norway and Blue Econet themselves, who are supported by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research of Germany. Uh, it's also being supported by um, members of the ETIP network, particularly one of our board members, uh, Professor Patrick Sorgalos, uh, and my colleagues, um, Alexandra Nates uh, and Catherine Pons, uh, and the vice chair of our Mirror Platform Working Group, Dr. Mika Egermont of Aquaculture Vlaanderen, who are uh, giving their support for this unpaid. So many thanks to them for that contribution. And I would very much at this point like to acknowledge the support we've had from within the European Commission, uh, particularly um, Siggy Gruber, whose name I'm sure is known to very many of you, um, who pushed strongly for this work. Uh, and from um, the uh, other side of the Atlantic, uh, we had input in the development thus far from a number of stakeholders um, but I'd like to give particular thanks to Eric Routledge at Embrapa for his support um, uh, and encouragement of getting where we are. The overall purpose of today is to introduce this joint action and to register notes of interest for you. I'm going to give you some background and methodology as to why this initiative um, is taking place. And so you know where we're coming from and hopefully we can move forward from there. So the next slide, please, will um, just set the scene a little bit. What do we mean by multi-stakeholder platforms? Well, there are many different um, versions and iterations of platforms. I'm coming from the perspective of a European uh, technology platform. I'll give um, an example of the ETIP case study in a moment. The purpose of European technology platforms was really to um, bring closer together the research and innovation agenda with uh, industry, citizen and stakeholder needs. There was a feeling there was too much of a disconnect between research um, activity that was being undertaken uh, and the actual impact and benefit of that. 
Uh, and you see in the uh, current situation, for example, that European technology platforms, and I've listed a few at the top of the slide there that we work with at ETIP in the agri-food sector, um, it allows us to engage um, in the prioritize, prioritization and development of research and innovation frameworks such as Horizon Europe, or to help contribute to policy initiatives such as uh, the European Strategic Guidelines for Aquaculture launched last week uh, at a Blue Farming in the EU event. Uh, the particular work on uh, looking at uh, development with Brazil, as I mentioned at the beginning there, it was encouraged by uh, the EC and other stakeholders, and it's built on the previous success of uh, other international support actions. Uh, and it may also be worth bearing in mind that for those of you who take an international outlook, um, uh, work undertaken by groups such as the FAO in their publication uh, on the state of world fisheries and aquaculture, or in all of the regional chapters that they published and presented to us last year, uh, particularly the um, regional reports on Latin America, the two reports in Africa and indeed Europe itself, acknowledged the benefit um, that multi-stakeholder platforms could bring to sustainable aquaculture development. Um, so that's a bit of background context of where we're coming from. Uh, moving on to the next slide, this is more of an introduction to the ETIP um, case study. And I emphasize this is a case study in terms of the joint action we're undertaking. This is not prescriptive. This is not stating what we will create or aim to create for other all Atlantic partners. This is how we currently do it in Europe um, uh, and the reasons why we do it in Europe and where we are coming from. So ETIP is one of the 39 European technology platforms. We were established uh, well over a decade ago. We are a formal organization with governance and statutes. We file accounts, but we are a registered not-for-profit organization registered in Belgium, but covering all of Europe. We're membership funded, we're multi-stakeholder, which means our membership is industry, academia, researchers, and civil society. We're industry-led, and we cover all of the um, production systems, all species, uh, and all um, uh, uh, types of production. Um, our contact details are there. As I say, the joint action may or may or not take this form, but that's who we are. The next slide demonstrates that we operate across the aquaculture value chain. Uh, we're not a producer's organization. We don't only represent primary production. We look at other aspects of aquaculture value, such as technology, equipment, veterinary services, diagnostics, farm health planning, feed processing, added value, governance, all aspects. And we, whatever we may think of governance and regulation, in the area of regulation, certification, and multi-stakeholder dialogue, um, Europe has uh, advanced and developed in this, and it's something we have good experience in. The next slide just very briefly shows our membership. I, as I referenced, we come from a number of different areas, industry, academia, research associations, and, and NGO groups. And in addition to those core member categories, uh, which will hopefully appear if the next slide um, is working, um, uh, we also have a number of other collaborations uh, we've referenced there the European Commission, who we work closely with, but also with groups such as FAO. And from a perspective of um, innovation investment, uh, we work alongside groups like Blue Invest, um, the European Investment Bank, uh, and so forth. We finally also operate, as the next slide demonstrates, with a mirror platform network. That's to say they are regional or national uh, innovation clusters. Um, who, in addition to the breadth that our core members demonstrated in the last slide, these show the depth that we reach. Uh, we have a network of over 800 members through this. Um, it gives us a, a real bottom-up approach, that's to say individual companies, micro-businesses, um, small family-run enterprises to the larger multinationals. And if you think of Europe, when we talk about European aquaculture, well, aquaculture is very broad and diverse, and so is Europe. We're talking of 27 member states, plus the UK, plus Norway, plus Iceland, plus Norway, plus the Black Sea countries, plus Turkey, sorry, I meant to say. So we have a broad range of people to build in. And this broad approach of networks and our mirror platforms 
um, lend legitimacy um, to our outreach. What all of these members do is demonstrated in this next slide. We create a strategic research and innovation agenda. We're now on the second iteration of that. Um, and this agenda is compiled with member priorities um, with uh, reference given to the sustainable development goals that we're all familiar with. It is then widely consulted on and operates um, as our core text and guidance in terms to the comments and answers and recommendations we provide. A little bit of, a little bit of detail is shown in this next slide, uh, which demonstrates we operate over three um, principal uh, pillars and nine chapters, bringing aquaculture to uh, the consumer, to society, uh, and focusing on industry priorities itself, all of which are the core pillars of sustainability. And we aim with a focus on innovation and technology to address the key challenges facing the sector. The four I've listed there come from uh, a European Commission publication um, looking at challenges with regard to administration, uh, access to space through coordinated spatial planning, competitiveness of the sector and a level playing field for the European industry. I mentioned um, uh, at the beginning that we have international experience um, in terms of platform development in other regions. And as this next slide shows, um, we, there's one particular case study I would like to raise with you. Uh, it was an international development, international support and development action funded by the European Commission through Horizon 2020 called EURASTIP. And it was looking um, at uh, developing synergies um, and sort of win-win situations between Europe and South Asia. Uh, this focused on the setup and development of three national aquaculture platforms in Vietnam, Thailand and Bangladesh, specifically chosen for the different aspects of the industry that they all represented, um, uh, with an eye to increasing Asian-European collaboration. Uh, the project included a uh, platform evaluation, the impact assessment of what we were doing and future roadmap development. And if you're interested in international application, I would encourage you to look into some further detail on that. Uh, in terms of the actions and legacy from that work, these come up in the next slide. So in addition to the establishment of the platform, the introduction of the multi-stakeholder platform methodology um, and the creation of the networks, they were then able to provide a number of supporting actions, such as 54 funded international exchange placements covering um, uh, applicants from the aquaculture industry, research and education sectors. There were international brokerage events and trade visits, including um, the uh, aid and assistance of the European External Action Service uh, and trade attaches, um, and international capacity building work, working, workshops in terms of aquaculture, education, innovation and skills. Um, uh, and from that work, we learned um, uh, a number of lessons in international platform development that it's primarily not necessarily easy or intuitive to other stakeholders to whom we're introducing this methodology. Uh, that from the very beginning, uh, the legacy and long term viability and self sustaining nature of these platforms must be addressed that the supporting actions such as the exchanges and tangible benefits I've, I've just mentioned there, um, they only come following extensive groundwork, uh, significant stakeholder mapping uh, and establishing the correct uh, connections. And it was only really after three years um, of uh, this platform work that we actually reached a position where we were able to capitalise um, going forward into the future. And I very much hope that work won't be lost. Um, the uh, work also involved um, considering applying different methodologies um, of platform development uh, as different contexts and different countries work in different way. So moving on quickly now to this uh, joint action through Anchor. Uh, it's been a long time in consideration. Um, you'll see on the slide there, there's been a number of meetings. Um, it was first mooted in uh, 2013. Uh, so it's been some time uh, in the development. The action was originally to look at um, uh, Brazil only, but it's grown both in terms of geographically and the scope of the joint action. Um, so it still includes Brazil, but has now extended um, to uh, consider other countries. 
It will address all stakeholders, so industry, research, education, governance, all sectors and species. So in addition to the focus on uh, integrated multi and low trophic aquaculture that we've been looking at so far, um, finfish production, intensive production, uh, that will also be uh, very much included uh, in this work uh, and all production methods as well. Uh, this would also, although we talk about Atlantic, um, include freshwater production and it's been made um, very clear to us that freshwater aqu aquaculture uh, is an important factor for um, some stakeholders, particularly from Brazil. And at the moment, we're in the scoping and the uh, scoping exercise stage of all those people um, that can be included. Uh, in terms of the formalities uh, of the joint action, as the next slide shows, we're currently in the preparatory stage. Within the anchor programme, we're working with the other joint actions and other working packages. Uh, there are joint actions on biotechnology, on communication, and there's a work package, for example, looking at the use of data um, within the ocean. So we're bringing the aquaculture experience to that work package. Um, but we're preparing um, uh, for the joint action in terms of a preparation for a Brazil case study uh, that will also have analysis and application uh, towards um, uh, South Africa. And there's a potential for, I, I would use the analogy of our mirror platforms, for cross-referencing with other countries. We've been asked specifically to look at the case for Argentina and Cape Verde, but there may be other um, uh, people and other people present in this workshop today who would be interested in uh, looking at that. We would present to the identified stakeholders who are interested the methodology and the concept of a multi-stakeholder platform, uh, and then it would be for these stakeholders themselves to consider how this can be applied to their own national circumstances, priorities, um, and the actors within their industries. As we, we've just heard in that last talk, all of the different countries um, have very different um, uh, priorities to consider. Uh, in terms of the actual event uh, itself, the next slide shows, um, this will be uh, an in-person guided brokerage event. Um, it will be uh, fully facilitated with translation services and so forth. The images I use there are ones taken from the Eurastip program. Um, and uh, perhaps after 18 months of uh, online working, uh, we might all begin to feel affectionate for those days when we gathered around a flip chart, as you can see illustrated, uh, and we actually were one on one working through these issues. Uh, there is a caveat here that uh, obviously um, current um, circumstances can't be ignored. Um, and uh, so uh, we, we have to take that into account. It's now envisaged this will take place in 2022. Uh, and we will be able at that event to work through um, the formal structuring of the platform, looking at membership, governance, finance and so forth consideration of a strategic research and innovation agenda and roadmaps for the platform development. The final slide uh, just sums that up. Um, the outcomes will be the development of platforms and the roadmap with a strategy um, for those going forward for further stakeholder consultation and development and hopeful adoption of a strategic research and innovation agenda. And why should that be happening? that such platforms are able to uh, roll out actions such as the exchanges, brokerage and capacity building to further develop um, sustainability in aquaculture development in the sector and to address future research and innovation needs that we have. Um, the joint actions are officially launched tomorrow at an event uh, within the main All Atlantic Conference. And after that point, you will be able to register your notes of interest through the ETIP website. And I would encourage you to do that. Failing which, the last slide shows contact information for me, and I'd urge you to get in touch if you have any questions on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, I think this is a great initiative. Thank you to EATIP for leading it. Um, and, I, and just to assure everybody, EATIP is a really uh, efficient and crucial organisation for us in terms of aquaculture in Europe. So very much appreciated. Thank you again, um, and please do contact David if you have any queries or uh, would like to be involved in, in any way. Good, all right. Um, 
So we now we have a slightly abridged, probably about 10 minute panel discussion or question and answer session. Um, I have to apologise. We've had an enormous amount of problems with the chat function. I'm not sure why, but uh, Teams seems to be extraordinarily temperamental these days. I have received some uh, some questions, which I think we'll run through those quickly, and then I think we'll have time for one or two open questions with just hands going up. So, Erd, I had a question early for you, but I'm going to come back to you because the last question is for you as well. Um, and then I just get through some of. Uh, okay, since you're here, we'll go. So, the first question was to explain again what the target of the Culp Cater Vision was. Uh, was intended for? Was it just abalone, other markets usages? I know you've answered this in the chat, but uh, and then there was a final question as well. Uh, the group in Austral, uh, DFFE and UCT are going to barcode Olvers and um, what the different partners are growing. Perhaps we could do that for both projects. Maybe you want to comment on those two? Yeah, to start with the first one, um, uh, today we produce uh, seaweed which we dry or ferment or freeze, not so much freeze. So so this uh, seaweed is, is uh, made f uh, in food grade and so uh, as business to business. So so the abalone feed um, opportunity is something we investigate in Aquavita, but today we already sell to the feed market and food market um, as in additives to, to those uh, products. Um, and your last question, I, I haven't seen the the question in the chat, and I must say I, I didn't really get the, got your question right. Something about Ulva or what was? Sorry, yeah, it's um, from John Bolton from Astral. So what I think we'll do is we'll put John and you together and um, get an answer to that question. It was about barcoding the Ulvas and whether or not it could be done between the two projects, which. Yeah, to me, it sounds like a really good idea. So we'll we'll make sure that you make contact with each other. Yep. yep. Thank you, Urd. Very good. Um, there were a lot of questions about getting hold of the presentations. Um, we can't just email them, unfortunately. But what we will do is make them after we have approval from the presenters available on the respective Astral and Aquavitae websites. And we will let people know that that has happened via email and then you can access them that way. So uh, as long as uh, the respective presenters approve it, then you will be able to access the presentations. Uh, a question about the MOOC, uh, Michaela, maybe you can um, answer this one. Is, uh, well, in fact, I, I can answer it, but I'll let you if you're still online here. Is the MOOC already online? Uh, unfortunately, no. We are, of course, the aim is to bring uh, results from the project uh, into the into the training material. So our aim is to have some of the uh, modules ready to go now in autumn, but the final kind of release will be next spring. Great. But if you have you. material, we are really happy. If you have some recent stuff that is relevant for these modules, please let us know because we can then refer it to it as uh, additional readings and additional material, and it will be able uh, like a like a portal for any teachers to find the material on low traffic aquaculture that they might not find elsewhere. Yeah, and just to reiterate that the in our eighteen month um, uh, eighteen month. Uh, reporting for Aquavitae, the MOOC um, was highlighted as a, a really uh, top uh, contribution that Aquavitae can make. So yeah, absolutely. If you, if you think you can contribute, please do so. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about um, one of the webinars that was on uh, Aquavitae and the low life uh, trophic uh, webinar series. You can go in and see all of those webinars on the Aquavitae website, so please do so. If you have any trouble uh, um, accessing them, let me know. But I know that the Oyster one is on there, so please go. And there's some really interesting talks there, I have to say, from some fantastic young researchers and students. Um, and finally, we had a, a comment from Rafael uh, Lagavello. Uh, uh, just some information more so that um, he has been involved in contributing to the Transatlantic MPA Network Ocean Governance Project, EU funded with Atlantic country, other Atlantic countries, including Europe, Brazil, US, Mexico, and that the platform is working on a resilience tool and that I th obviously I think this would be a 
great to link uh, this work together with um, Astral, and Elisa has already responded that uh, Astral will be keen, and I'm absolutely certain uh, Wagner has responded as well, saying that uh, on behalf of Aqua Vitae would also be very interested. Do you want to add any comment there, Rafaela? No, perhaps Rafael is not with us anymore. Um, again, you know, we can facilitate the contacts um, uh, uh, as we follow up on this meeting. So the final question I have um, is to Charlotta. Would the monitoring tool, this is from Michaela, um, would the monitor, monitoring tool that BioOcean Ore is developing have been able to identify the, oh dear, <laughs> the bloom uh, in time in North Norway uh, that happened a couple of days ago. I can't I can't pronounce that species. Chris uh, Chrysochromulina. Sorry, Chrysochromulina, and I said two days because you were asking me questions at the same time. So I mean two years ago. It was summer two, two years ago. Okay. We lost twenty thousand yeah. tons of of uh, salmon. So my question is just, I it looks really impressive. So I'm just curious how how soon early enough would they know about a new bloom arriving? Under development, but we are aiming to do exactly that. Uh, I remember this uh, particular big bloom in Norway uh, two years ago. It was it was quite huge. Um, we are aiming to uh, detect a few days ago, uh, based on the environment and, for example, the oxygen drop uh, that is um, uh, caused by by the bloom. Uh, we can see it very early. So if we can see it very early, we can in, it can indicate uh, that a bloom is coming. And also with some uh, chlorophyll sensors and some um, uh, uh, satellite imaging, uh, it will be um, something that we will uh, be able to do. But for now, uh, it is still a task under development. Uh, we are involved by Sano in several projects. So, so there is Astral. Uh, but there is also several projects, so it's really some subject that is really uh, getting a lot of importance now. Um, and I believe that in the next year we will have some first results. And and this kind of big bloom should have been uh, detected a bit early. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> yeah, it is very interesting. Also, the connection with the Part B uh, projects in a BGOA core, which is all the oceanic monitoring. There must be some very close links there as well, are there, Charlotte? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Um, and then we have a final question, uh, which, well, or comment perhaps from Alexandra Nutz, which is that there is an, uh, who is also from Airtip, I should say. Um, this, well, actually, uh, Alexandra, do you want, uh, you mentioned there's an All Atlantic workshop on data space for the ocean initiated by Blue Cloud. I wasn't aware of that. Perhaps Astral is, or do you want to comment on that, uh, Alexander or Elisa? Uh, yes, thank you. Well, I was just uh, mentioning it because there's a lot of things going on on that uh, as aspect as well, and they do often uh, forget a little bit about aquaculture. So it's mostly on on the data itself and and ocean monitoring. So I think the link between the aquaculture business and and why it is useful for for both siting allocating farms but also for better optimizing the 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 the, the, the operation of farms would be interesting so i was just wondering have you been looking at this aspect as well um elisa maybe you can yeah, comment there yeah uh, from the astral point of view uh, we are not directly involved I saw the I saw the um, the event, but uh, I, as uh, as Alexander was saying, it seems to be more about you know ecosystem functioning and uh, data. But it's definitely something that we have to breach uh, this you know uh, let's say basic science and more applied science uh, in a way that what Astral and Aquavita are doing that is more uh, in a way industry related uh, or or orientated towards. You know more applied science. Uh, definitely, we should, uh, Philip, look into it and uh, uh, bring our perspective in uh, in this uh, in this context. Mm. Definitely. Thank great, you. Alexander, great. Great. Maybe we out. can. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Maybe we can continue to to collaborate on that as well as we have Absolutely. been a little bit involved. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. Great, thank you. And actually, so there is one more question there, which perhaps well, that's to you, David. So maybe we can end, and then I, I would ask for Elisa and David to give their final sort of wrapping up comments. But um, there's a question to you, David. Thanks for the great presentation. Just would like to add that from the Brazilian side, there are key universities also engaged with the Bria Tip Initiative, UNESP, uh, uh, University of Santa Catarina, and FERG, of course and also the Brazilian Science and Technology Ministry, ANCA Focal Point in Brazil, which I'm, uh, that's from Eric, a message from Eric there, yeah. So I guess just reiterating that it has been going for some time and is a very broad uh, initiative. Uh, yes, that's correct. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself there. Um, yes, there's been a number of stakeholders engaged um, uh, and a number of people we've worked with. Um, uh, as I said in my introduction, Eric gave us um, some uh, great help uh, in reaching them. Um, and thank you very much for flagging um, uh, uh, those organisations in the chat now. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I, I will I will stop the question and answer section. We've got a few minutes left. And in that time, I'd just like to offer Elisa the opportunity to sort of wrap up her thoughts. David as well, and then I have a couple of very final messages before we go. Yeah, Elisa. thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I think it's been a really very a nice event, a uh, very nice presentation and the interaction also with, uh, with the audience that I hope is not stopping here because of course this is just a flavor of uh, what is being what is going on uh, in the Atlantic Ocean and the different levels and different uh, in a way in, in multi-sectorial uh, not only science industry and so on we need to continue this dialogue so please continue to engage with all of us as you see uh, we are um, collaborating closely among us and uh, as i said before i think together we go further than than alone so i'm really very impressed about uh, the nice science that is being uh, going on now but also the uh, the science that uh, all the projects that have been before us where we stay on their shoulder basically we are grateful for what they have done so we can bring uh, science a little bit further so thank you so much thanks elisa i can assure you we're very happy to have you <laughs> alongside us uh, from aquavita uh, da david I, I pass the floor to you um well, yes, really to build on what um, Elisa was just saying there, um, this is very much the beginning. Um, uh, to take a multi-stakeholder platform approach, one of the purposes of a multi-stakeholder platform um, is to put research into practice. It's to disseminate research outputs. It's to ensure there's impact and it's to ensure there's relevance in addition to shaping future strategic research and innovation agendas. That's certainly why we exist at ETIP. Um, and I think uh, that's an opportunity um, that uh, the joint action we've been uh, asked to lead affords. So if you've been listening to these events and you've heard of these um, two excellent projects that are going on uh, and you have your own thoughts and you think, well, that's all very interesting. But, you know, for what we really need in Atlantic aquaculture to progress and to uh, develop further um, is topic x y and z what my university could contribute is this what my company needs is this um, then i think our joint action that we're working on gives an opportunity to engage in that um, and hopefully we can um, bring together more of the activities that are going on and have a better understanding of all atlantic aquaculture research great thank you i could not agree more with the comments both from uh, Elisa and from David. I'm just going to end here with um, a couple of shameless plugs for our projects. Uh, <laughs> uh, firstly, from Astral, um, uh, Elisa, I'm not sure if you want to say anything, but there will be, I understand, a newsletter coming up just after summer. Do you want to say a quick word about that? Um, yeah, as I said, we are reaching our first uh, first year, so we are learning how to how to work now. Uh, so we are in the pipeline of both the newsletter and as Marisa was uh, was saying before, we are also in the pipeline webinars and uh, online courses uh, as to to um, to help you know the the transfer of knowledge and the capacity building. So stay tuned because they are coming. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. And also from Aquavita, if you want to learn more, we've just come up to our two year anniversary, 24 months. So there's a newsletter about to come out. Please sign up if, if you want to follow us. We'd be very happy and pleased to have you. Um, and just one final slide before I finish up, um, mentioning the Alternet, which is a relatively new Atlantic low trophic aquaculture network that's been set up. It's not part of Aquavita, but it's very, very closely linked. It's a quick and easy way to follow current news and events in terms of low trophic aquacultures. They're going to use a web crawler to update news, but also people can go in and contribute themselves. So please check it out if you're interested. And the EU has also asked me to um, put a plug in for the upcoming webinar series Horizon for Aquaculture. Three Horizon 2020 projects, impact, gain and efficiency, are collaborating to hold a series of webinars based on collective project outputs. Um, and they've got three webinars, three events. The first on June 15th, which is IMTA policy and market. Second on the 22nd, IMTA circular aquaculture. And the third on June 29th, which is precision aquaculture. So obviously highly relevant for everybody here today. I put up here contacts. Please contact Elisa, David or myself if you have any further questions or if there are questions that weren't answered and you would like us to forward them on to the speakers. Um, just a couple of thanks from me, obviously to the European Commission for give, giving the opportunity for us to meet and be um, a part of this bigger meeting as a side session. Thanks to Vala at Maris for running um, the Teams platform today. Natalie Ospina from Air Centre in Azores, from Astral for helping to coordinate. And a big thank you to Rosa Chapella, Mercedes Fernandez from Setmar in Spain for organising, pulling together the programme and liaising with the EU. Thank you very, very much. And certainly not least, thanks to everybody for joining. Everybody has an immense pressure on their time these days, so we really appreciate you taking and offering your time to come and join us in the, in the webinar today. Hope you've enjoyed it. Any questions, don't hesitate to come back and we look forward to seeing you in the next one perhaps. Thank you.